Nikki Strong, and this is VOA1, The Hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Anna Mateo and Brian Lynn. Later, Steve Ember will present our American history series, The Making of a Nation. But first, Democratic Party lawmakers in the United States Congress introduced immigration legislation last Thursday. The proposed law would create an eight-year path to citizenship for millions of undocumented immigrants in the United States. The legislation would also provide a faster path to citizenship for those brought to the country illegally as children. Under the bill, immigrants who are not legally in the country can apply to become legal if they were in the United States on or before January 1, 2021. They must pay all required costs and, in most cases, must not have a criminal record. There are special requirements for temporary protected status holders, agricultural workers, and those who arrived in the United States as children. Such children are known as dreamers. Hassan Ahmad is an immigration lawyer in the state of Virginia. He told VOA, Having a criminal record or certain types of crimes on your record, or if you're a national security concern, would serve to prevent you from getting relief under the bill. The first step for applicants would be to secure Lawful Prospective Immigrant Status, or LPI. That is a way to have legal permanent residence in the United States. LPI status would be effective for six years. But immigrants would have to wait at least five years to apply for legal permanent residence, also known as green card status. They would be required to pass security investigations and pay all taxes required by U.S. law. After three years of green card status, an immigrant would be able to apply for U.S. citizenship. Someone with LPI status could legally work and travel outside the U.S. and be lawfully admitted back into the country. Those going through the LPI process would be protected from being expelled from the country while the government is deciding their applications. Those living temporarily in the United States or visiting the country with a visa would not be covered under the bill. Those who can be or already are a part of the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program will be able to apply directly for a green card. Other groups that may apply directly include temporary protected status holders and those who have been agricultural workers for at least five years. These groups must then wait five years to be eligible for U.S. citizenship. Under current immigration law, those who stay in the U.S. illegally for more than 180 days but less than one year are banned for three years from returning to the U.S. Those who are unlawfully present for more than one year are banned for 10 years. The bill calls for ending the three- and ten-year bans on people who lived in the United States illegally and then left. The United States is also preparing to admit up to 125,000 refugees each year beginning in October. That is an increase from a 15,000 refugee limit 
at the end of the administration of former President Donald Trump. The announcement could change the lives of people like Abdirazak Noor Ibrahim. Ibrahim is originally from Somalia. He left the country in 2004 and became a refugee in Nairobi, Kenya. Ibrahim and his family were approved to travel to the U.S. for resettlement in early 2017. However, then-President Trump signed orders restricting travel from several countries, including Somalia. Ibrahim told VOA that he felt bad hearing about the ban. But now I am so hopeful, since there is a change of administrations, I will be accepted and taken to the country, he said. The president decides the upper limit of admitted refugees in October and sends the plans to Congress. Yael Shocker is with Refugee International. She said over 35,000 refugees had been approved by United States Citizenship and Immigration Services as of December 2020. The U.S. State Department says about 11,814 refugees arrived in the United States in 2020. Shocker said people who are resettled in the United States already, who came as refugees, have the ability to apply to have their family members to resettle as refugees as well. Supporters of Trump's immigration plan warn against undoing policies they consider important to America's safety. Laura Reese is a researcher at the Heritage Foundation, a conservative research group. She said there was a study of the Program for Security Investigations of Refugees at the beginning of the Trump administration. She said that policy should be repeated by future administrations. It should not be thrown out by the new administration just because Trump's name was attached to it, she told VOA. From VOA Learning English, this is the Health and Lifestyle Report. Last year, many people across the world looked to their gardens to find enjoyment and peace during the coronavirus pandemic. Gardens were established in communities and homes with vegetables, flowers, and many other different kinds of plants. Stores that sell gardening equipment and supplies experienced shortages. Millions of people found happiness, release, and a sense of safety outdoors with their hands in the dirt. To many, the spring and summer of 2020 might seem like a very long time ago and much of the gardening activity stopped once winter set in. But as we look forward to a new spring and the hope that COVID-19 vaccines will bring lasting change, gardening offers another promise of light. Catherine S. White, an American writer and active gardener, once described three kinds of gardens that can fill our time during the winter months. White identified the three in a piece for the New Yorker. The garden outdoors, the garden of pots and bowls in the house, and the garden of the mind's eye. Here is a look at some possible ways to enjoy these three kinds of gardening. To the eye, 
there is little in a winter garden that can compare to spring and summer's active life and colorful growth. Only the most serious gardeners or those in warmer climates can keep the growing going outside. This often involves building protective materials around plants to help them survive the cold. But there are smaller joys to be had. The tree's empty branches can create beautiful silhouettes and better views of birds and sunsets. Landscape photographer Larry Letterman, author of the recent book Garden Portraits, suggests getting to know your garden better in the winter when everything is bare and you can see the bones of the land. Gardens can also remind us that winter is just one stop on the path to other seasons. Death is everywhere in a garden, all year round, but it makes rebirth possible. A lot of plants keep going. Winter can also be a good time to re-examine your own personal battles against climate change. We can start or continue composting, and we can research services, products, and methods to help make next year's garden more sustainable. House plants are hot now, and social media is full of plant photos. New technologies make it easier to grow plants anywhere indoors, with or without soil. The plants offer not only beauty, but the rewards of caring for living things and seeing them grow. Indoor vegetable gardening, too, has become especially popular, both as a food source and as a family activity. For example, small contained gardens can be bought and placed next to the window. Mushrooms can be grown in a cardboard box, or tomatoes can easily be grown in a bottle. A rise in indoor gardening has driven up sales for greenhouses, growing lights, and seeds. One seed company in the northeastern state of Maine, Johnny's Selected Seeds, recently suspended orders from home gardeners temporarily. It said that because of COVID-19, the large number of orders it was receiving could not be effectively filled. The garden of the mind's eye is the one we imagine and plan. Author and gardener Jamaica Kincaid once said, I shall never have the garden I have in my mind, but that for me is the joy of it. Certain things can never be realized, and so all the more reason to attempt them. Gardening companies promise that all of us can create better gardens with some work. Maybe that means removing grass and planting more flowers and vegetables. It could also mean choosing more native plants, reducing water use, and adding paths and new water designs. A garden is never finished. And the planning process can be creative and hopeful. And as our second pandemic spring nears, those hopes are being supported by the release of new vaccines. The garden can be a metaphor for peace, safety, success, and calm. Not a bad place for the mind's eye to rest, especially in this most unsettling of winters. And that's the Health and Lifestyle Report. I'm Ana Mateo. And I'm Brian Lynn. To help protect yourself against the new coronavirus, wash your hands for 20 seconds with soap and water before you eat, after using the toilet, and after touching anything many other people touch, like a seat on a public bus. 
If you cannot wash your hands with soap and water, use an alcohol-based hand sanitizer that contains at least 60% alcohol. Taking these steps can help prevent not only the new coronavirus disease, but also colds, flu, and other viruses. For more information, visit the following websites. The World Health Organization at www.who.int or the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention at www.cdc.gov. Welcome to the Making of a Nation, American History in VOA Special English. I'm Steve Ember. In December 1941, the United States was at war. It declared war against Japan after Japanese pilots attacked the American naval base at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. A few days later, Germany and Italy declared war against the United States. President Franklin Roosevelt quickly decided that America could not fight major campaigns in the Pacific and in Europe at the same time. He and his advisors decided to fight first against the Germans and Italians. Then, when victory in Europe seemed sure, the United States could turn to fight the Japanese in Asia. This left the Japanese free to extend their power throughout Asia and the Western Pacific. Soon after the attack at Hawaii, Japanese forces invaded Hong Kong, Malaya, and the Philippines. American forces in the Philippines suffered heavy losses, and Manila fell to Japanese troops. In February 1942, Japan's forces won a great victory against the British in Singapore. Japanese forces marched into Burma, they attacked Ceylon, now Sri Lanka, and captured the Andaman Islands in the Bay of Bengal. The Japanese military forces seemed too strong to stop. President Roosevelt sent some forces to the Pacific, and he began to rebuild the American naval forces destroyed at Pearl Harbor but he sent most of America's military strength to Europe. The United States rushed troops and war equipment to help Britain survive against Adolf Hitler's Germany. American military leaders wanted to fight Germany quickly by launching an attack across the English Channel. But British Prime Minister Winston Churchill opposed this. He and others feared such an invasion might fail. So British and American forces attacked Italian and German occupation troops in North Africa. They defeated them and then crossed the Mediterranean Sea to attack enemy forces in Sicily. Within weeks, they pushed the Germans out of Sicily to the Italian mainland. The Allied invasion of Italy followed. Hitler could not strengthen his forces in North Africa and Italy because Germany also was fighting hard in the Soviet Union. Hitler's decision early in the war to attack the Soviet Union was a serious mistake. It divided his men and materials. His plan was to defeat Soviet forces quickly with one strong attack. But he failed, and his failure cost him valuable troops and supplies that might have helped him win the battles for North Africa and Italy.
Germany's attack on the Soviet Union began with great success. In the middle of 1941, a German force of more than three million men invaded the Soviet Union. It captured the Ukraine, took control of Kiev, and marched deep into Russia. The situation changed the following year. Soviet forces under Marshal Georgi Zhukov won a fierce battle for the city of Stalingrad, now Volgograd. A great many German soldiers died from cold and hunger during the bitter winter months that followed. Zhukov's forces attacked the German troops and pushed back the invaders. Other Soviet troops forced the Germans away from the city of Leningrad, now St. Petersburg. By the middle of 1944, German forces throughout the Soviet Union were retreating, and Soviet forces were preparing to push them over the border and invade Germany themselves. The fighting came at a terrible cost. Huge numbers of soldiers and civilians were killed. The fighting in World War II was not limited to land. Battles were also being fought on the sea. The main goal of the German Navy during the war was to prevent the United States from sending ships to Britain with war materials, food, and troops. At first, the Germans were very successful. There was hunger in Britain in 1941 because so few ships could cross the North Atlantic with food. German submarines were the greatest danger to ships crossing the Atlantic. These U-boats, as the Germans called them, could hide below the surface and attack without warning. The threat from German submarines did not ease until new technology was developed in 1943. Allied scientists improved sonar and radar systems that helped find submarines on the surface and underwater. More of the enemy submarines were found and destroyed. The Allies slowly gained control of the Atlantic. Allied and German warships fought a number of traditional naval battles, but airplanes came to play an increasingly important part in the fighting at sea. British ships, with the help of planes launched from an aircraft carrier, destroyed a powerful German battleship, the Bismarck, on May 27, 1941. The most famous air battle of the war in Europe took place during the summer and autumn of the previous year. It was known as the Battle of Britain. It got its name from a speech to Parliament by Prime Minister Churchill following the evacuation of British and French forces from Dunkirk. This is the BBC Home Service. Here is the news. In the House of Commons this afternoon, the Prime Minister, Mr. Churchill, said, What General Vega called the Battle of France is over. The Battle of Britain is about to begin. It was the most extensive aerial bombing yet in the war. It was also the first battle to be fought entirely in the air. German Stuka dive bombers attacked shipping centers, 
areas of political importance, airfields, and airplane factories. Luftwaffe pilots in their Messerschmitts battled the hurricanes and spitfires of the Royal Air Force. While the flying skills of the German and British pilots were well matched, it was ultimately the greater maneuverability of the British Spitfire that won the long months of battle over the English Channel. The British victory in the air helped prevent Operation Sea Lion, a planned German invasion of Britain. In May of 1942, Britain's Royal Air Force carried out an attack on Germany with 1,000 bombers. It was just the first of many bombing runs over Germany and German-occupied areas by the air forces of Britain and the United States. The planes bombed German military and industrial centers. They also bombed civilian targets in an effort to demonstrate to the German people the price of Germany's aggression. The German cities of Cologne, Dresden, and Hamburg suffered widespread destruction. The Allied bombing attacks continued until the war's end in 1945. Hitler's victories in the early months of the war had struck fear into the hearts of people throughout the world. Hitler and his Axis allies had won battle after battle. They had captured most of Western Europe and invaded the Soviet Union. They had seized North Africa and their submarines controlled the Atlantic. Germany continued to seem strong during the first months after the United States entered the war in Europe. But the situation began to change. German strength and control were greatest in November of 1942. After then, the mighty German military machine began to slow down. Germany and its Axis partner Italy suffered serious losses in the first six months of 1943. German losses were extremely heavy in the Soviet Union. 160,000 German troops died at Stalingrad and more than 110,000 surrendered. American and British forces captured 250,000 German and Italian troops in North Africa. Many more thousands were killed or captured in Sicily and the Italian mainland. German submarines were being destroyed in the North Atlantic, allowing more Allied troops and supplies to reach Britain. By the end of 1943, Hitler and his armies no longer seemed so strong. But German forces continued to occupy France, Belgium, and much of the rest of Western Europe. Now the time had come for the Allies to invade German-held Europe from Britain. Allied forces planned the greatest military invasion in history to break the German control of Europe and win the war. People of Western Europe, a landing was made this morning on the coast of France by troops of the Allied Expeditionary Force. This landing is part of the concerted United Nations plan for the liberation of Europe. Although the initial assault may not have been made in your own country, the hour of your liberation is approaching. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.